Lindsay, we're here obviously at the launch of Union Cup uh, yes. 2019. Very exciting day and huge amount of positivity in the room just now. And I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked you inside. What? Yeah. Tell, tell me about the importance of Union Cup 2019 to the LGBT community in Ireland. Um, well, as an openly gay international rugby player, for me to see that we have now Europe's largest um, gay inclusive tournament coming to Ireland for the first time, 45 teams, 15 countries, and we're leading the way um, through the form of sport and, and the sport of rugby to show the world what we can do and how we can host and that we host it for everybody. Like These are non-professionals. It's all well and good making bids for World Cups and hosting World Cups. We have to you know, get behind those who are at the game from a, a you know, a lower level and a grassroots level and, and say that the sport is for all and um, sport brings everyone together in great joy and that's what, you know, the message is about. I was surprised to read um, a piece of research from the UK in the lead into this and I know that the guys inside said there's going to be another piece of research in an Irish context which yes. I'm sure is hugely important but surprised to see that the over 80% I think for both gay men and gay women the level of homophobic insults that they were still subject to. Is that something that, is it, you surprised by that at all or have you experienced Yeah, I am still surprised at it, but you know, at the end of the day, we all know or have experienced bullies on some smaller or huge level and people like that who were, you know, want to hurt you, they'll hurt you where they know they'll hurt you most. And unfortunately, when you are openly gay or people know you're in the LGBT community, um, they will try and hit you where it hurts. And that's unfortunate that they would go to that level. But there are people out there who will, and and but at the same time, we've seen it with Nigel Owens, we've seen it with Gareth Thomas. Um, hopefully, we, we there's other stories similarly that when people are subject to that, that the world gets behind them and and tightens that protection in front of them and and forms a shield and says no, that's not okay. And mm -hmm. you know, there are people at the end of the day, and you know, you have to take them at face value. You need to judge the person person for who they are and what they bring. Mm -hmm. Um not anything to do with their personal life so we want you know obviously it is an lgbt tournament but it is open to non-lgbt um, teams it's open to everybody if it's your first time coming even to see rugby come and visit it you know the north side obviously uh, historically hasn't been huge for rugby um at regard schools and clubs comparative to the south side of dublin so it's going to be held in dcu um so if you're around come and, and have a glimpse and support and there's nothing better running onto a pitch where you hear a load of fans roaring such positivity and urging it on and that's what we want to create for for this tournament as well the other thing that and it seems like we're as a country almost getting our stuff together when it comes to women in sport which is uh it's taken a while but it seems like we are getting we're in some sort of a path yes and obviously th there's going to be a women's uh cup separate in this one which is again a huge step along that ladder yes and you know we're here to talk about equality we're here from an lgbt um angle but for me to hear there was a dedicated women's tournament is huge because again i'm a very proud um, athlete who has played on elite level but it has been all along through you know being an amateur really and working full time and relying on the goodwill of you know whether it be DCU or my club Railway Union or DCU Mercy when I was there or Dublin to provide um, that professional and elite environment I wouldn't have been able to do that um, so you know it's important that it's not just words mm. you know i'm tired of words i want actions and this was a huge statement to have a women's tournament and you know i can't stress enough that the you know when we strive for equality for women whether the workplace or sport we need to when it's open and this tournament has been open and we need people to get involved we need to put our shoulders to the wheel and drive it forward mm. and make sure that this isn't the only time that we've seen a dedicated women's tournament that it, it continues all along um every two years when the when the union cup is held are we getting our stuff together is probably well, how i should have phrased that uh, as a country when it comes to women's sport we are in bits we're saying the right things now we need to start doing the right things um you know we can't try and compete with england and france unless we get money behind us because we just can't compete you know we need to um put those frameworks in place that you know our players can train professionally or semi-professionally to try and match the standards of those standard bearers in the women's game such as england france usa canada new zealand they're all going to play in the summer like look how many games mm -hmm. they're getting at an international level they get to blood new players they don't have to wait till the six nations to see how we go and then you just don't have time to fix it so you know that's not me focusing on 
the RFU with rugby because they need a big sponsor on board. They need money to help us. Um, and it's, it's about everybody rolling in. And as I said, it's, you know, the goals and the words are, are fabulous. But I need stepping stones and I need stepping stones towards actions to push mm. this, you know. And how, how, like how far you mentioned the RFU and obviously the sponsors, because I think that might be one of the key parts to unlocking all of this. Yes. And there are some uh, major blue chip brands obviously involved with uh, Union Cup, which is great to see. But how far away then are we from? Because I mean, I think if anybody uh, uh, pays any attention to what's happening in the women's game with the Six Nations, there has been a bit of regression over the last three years down to some of the reasons I think that you've mentioned yep. in terms of what's happening in England and France. How far are we here from getting to that level? Um, I think I think we're a little bit off. We are a little bit off. Like when, you know, England have to be, this just didn't happen overnight, say if we look at, we focus on the, the Tyrrells Premiership. This didn't happen overnight. The RFU, yes, there was uproar about them taking back the professional contracts, but they actually reinvested the money into the club game because they felt it was better spent there. And I think that was the right decision. They've obviously introduced the contracts again because hopefully the success has brought more revenue yeah. and more revenue to be invested and, and give back um, those contracts. So, um, I mean, if we're talking about sponsors, we probably need a sponsor of the AIL, we need to look at the provincial structure because they'll all have impact to feeding in, as we can see with the men's game. You know, you have schools rugby, you have colleges rugby, you have under 20s, you have, you have a pathway. So now when we see the likes of Josh Van Der Feer and Dan Levy, who just didn't appear out of nowhere, they've been on a pathway, they've been on a journey, they've been on a development journey. So when they come up to international level and they get their chance in the autumn internationals, they're prepared, you know, and we've had crossover athletes, you know, but we have seen the likes of Leah Lyons for Menya Breen, who've played in Skibreen and, and Highfield at a very young age. And you can see the skill, you know, the difference in the skill set. And you can see then Leah playing in Harlequins and Anna Kaplis. Now, they have to, we have to, you know, pay attention and give credit to the foundations that were laid here for them. But the fact that they're playing against internationally recognised players week in, week out. The lads had 18 Premiership games, which they released for. Uh, Aoife McDermott's had four I've had one and a half how do you compete mm. so is there a danger then that I mean the likes of yourself is looking at what's going on over there and as you say the profession contracts are back and that's only going to raise all boats I assume mm. that it'd be pretty tempting to get out of the game here I'm sure and go over there and earn some money out of it well yeah I mean if I was 10 years younger and, and a club over there felt I was good enough and I didn't have the family commitments I have I would be gone mm. you know because of my competitive nature I want to be the best and to be put in an environment where again I'm pitching myself against the best in the world that's where I want to be and you can't deny people that if they're you know if you, you want to push that you want to foster that so again I don't think there's no one person to blame but as we can see I think it was after 2010 when in England um, won the World Cup, um, they reinvested that money and they put investment into the game. So they've been building for a large number yeah. of years. So um, I think it's the right structure. They made decisions at the right time and it paid off. It might have gone opposite for them, but I'm sort of thinking, how quickly do we fix this now when we have a World Cup qualification to look forward to mm -hmm. You know, Six Nations next year? And I think it'd be a very sad state at first to have um, a World Cup in 2021 without an Irish team because... Regardless of how small this nation is, we make a big impact in the world. And we've seen that with world sporting events. And that's what we do. And that's what we do well. And, and we're competitive and we compete. And, and we bring everything that's positive about sport. Um, and I, for one, would be heartbroken if we weren't there. Is there any sense that being out here, because I think a lot of what you're talking about is encouraging and nurturing the grassroots and building it from there. Is there any sense that on the other side of that too, the likes of yourselves have been out on this pitch a bit more often, that that might actually help grow the... 100%. If you don't expose your athletes to the world, how will the world know them? And what better stage when in a historic venue, whether we're talking, we're obviously talking about rugby, but there's been historic nights in soccer here as well. So again, we spoke about big sponsors who are, you know, influencers and powerful people and organisations sending a message to the world. I'm asking those people to do the same with women in sport and get behind us and take a chance and see where it can it can go because I think we can go very far and I think we've seen it in the States, we've seen it in other elite women's sports that the AFL final, over 54 yeah, and a half yeah, thousand yeah. watched in the Oval. I want that in this day. Like the lads knew their way around the Aviva. I've only been here as a spectator mm -hmm. and what I would give to play in front of a full stadium. Like I, 
I'll take to my dying day the memories of running out onto Croke Park through that tunnel. Mm. And they're just some of my happiest memories to play in the third largest stadium in Europe and to have that opportunity. And not all athletes will have that. And I want to change that. And I want to do all I can to action that change. Yeah. Not sit here with you as much as I'm enjoying it, <laughs> but to talk about that. Good. Well, I think the movement in general uh, could do with more people like you and uh, hearing more of that. In other words, thank you very much. So far.